Bond market correlations are breaking. This might be a sign of what's to come. To illustrate exactly what's going on, we can use the recent construction spending data uh, to explain exactly what's occurring. On the month-over-month basis, a construction spending uh, was released. This is total construction. Uh, it's down 0.1% following last month, 02 Of course, on a year-over-year basis, I think the picture's a little bit more clear. Uh, it's up 10%. This is the lowest uh, level we've seen in several months now, actually. Uh, that's construction spending, the total construction. Now, the numbers overall are weak, and I think this is why we're starting to see a divergence in the bond market, which we're going to show you in just a moment. Now, construction spending is broken down into several categories. The two weakest categories include commercial, that's down 0.13% on a year-over-year basis, and then lodging, uh, down over 2%. This is lodging on a month-over-month basis. It's down 1.6%. It's not as bad as last month, but we're seeing several months in negative territory. On a year-over-year basis, this is pretty shocking. Lodging on construction spending, down negative 2.1%. 2.1%. It's the first negative reading we've seen since 2022. On a month over month basis, construction spending and commercial. And this is really the theme. Uh, we're going to see this in another uh, way just in just a moment. The commercial spending and construction spending, it's down 1.1% on a month over month basis. The month over month really kind of gives us immediate direction but the long-term trend is better illustrated by year-over-year. On a year-over-year basis, we're in negative territory for the first time in several years. This, again, is the amount of money that's being spent on a year-over-year basis comparison in the commercial sector. We've all heard stories about these shopping malls that are now sitting empty. This is what it looks like in terms of a chart. Now, construction spending on a year-over-year basis, we can take a look at one of the strongest sectors that's manufacturing. Over the past month, several months, we've heard better numbers with the Philly Fed, Empire State, New York index. Well, this is a construction spending. This is, again, remember, one of the strongest segments in construction spending is manufacturing on the month-over-month basis, nothing. It's only up 0.9%, uh, barely in positive territory. On a year-over-year basis, it's the worst number we've seen in a long time, up only 17%. This is not really representative of a strong sector. And yet, remember again, manufacturing represents the strongest or one of the strongest segments of construction spending overall. Now, why is this all important? Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of context. This chart is 2006 to 2008, going from a very strong to a very weak economy, The blue bars at the bottom show us residential construction spending. The red bars, non-residential. When we say non-residential, it means commercial, industrial, things of that nature. Notice the pattern that happened. Of course, we know 2008 was defined by the housing market crash. So, of course, we saw a cutback uh, in residential construction spending. That's why those blue bars are so low. But the red bars, the commercial, the non-residential, that really started to decline. And the true recession is defined when both of these residential and non-residential construction spending sectors are both in the decline. Well, now, present date, again, blue bars are residential, uh, non-residential are the red bars. And notice what's happening over here. Remember, when we say non-residential, it's another way of saying commercial industrial, commercial, shopping malls. This is a construction spending. Now, the residential construction spending is improving, but maybe we can explain this in, uh, from a different point of view. We spoke about this last week. We have something called the lock-in effect. Existing home sales inventory is very low. Why? Nobody wants to sell and, and get out of their low interest rate mortgage that they got a couple of years ago and roll themselves into a new house or a new condo with a high interest rate mortgage. So home builders have the incentive to build because there's such low inventory. We don't have that low inventory problem with non-residential. So I think it's very much telling how the decline we see in non-residential construction spending. Again, going back from, from 2006 through eight. 
Uh, the blue bar shows residential construction spending. Remember, it was very weak during that housing crisis. And notice the correlation with the red bars, which represent new homes sold. This is the average sales price. All of this is on a year-over-year -year basis. And really, the beginning of 2007 through eight, both figures were in negative territory. The point in this chart is to show you the very strong cor uh, correlation. Why do we look at construction spending? It's a leading indicator. What happens in the spending leads to the eventual sales. When we see a cut in the spending, we see the cut in sales. Well, this is present date. Blue bars, residential construction spending. Red bars, average sales price. The average sales price, it's hanging in there. It's not really improving. New homes, it's a different animal than the existing homes. The existing homes, there's a smaller inventory again because you know we don't want to sell our homes. But new homes are built by home builders, and they just want to build and sell. So those new homes sold, average sales price figures are somewhat suppressed. Uh, the construction spending is improving, uh, but we're going to watch this. And this is maybe one of the takeaways, uh, the, you know, our homework, so to speak. Watch the residential construction spending. If this starts to falter, we already know the non-residential is on the decline. Now, getting to the point of what we wanted to talk about here, uh, this is the bond market and the divergence, or not a divergence, uh, but a break in the correlation. Well, these are the changes, blue bars, daily change, red weekly and, and yellow monthly. Notice the big action, what's happening in the bond market. It's the midterm maturities, five-year, 10-year. On a weekly basis, these yields have been crushed. What's going on here? These are all the different yields going back about you know almost nine months or so. And we can see in particular, all the yields have gone down. But in particular, it's really the midterm maturities. Long term, you could say, yeah, 30 years well. But the short term maturities at the top, the three month, the six month, those haven't really moved that much. It's all in the mid to long term maturities. Again, mid to long term maturities indicate the expectation of long term economics. What's the economy look like six months or a year from now? We're going to show you in just a second a different way we can confirm what actually is happening. Now, this is a correlation that we expect to see over time. Red line, S&P 500. Blue line, 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. We see an inverse correlation. What happens? The 10-year yield goes up. At, in, for example, as economics improve, we get good jobs numbers and good you know, manufacturing numbers. And you know, all the traders out there say, hey, you know, the economy is good. I don't think the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates. And, uh, you know, maybe we're on the road to recovery. And that's why the 10-year bond yield at that point, we're talking about last year, went up. Well, the stock market doesn't like the prospect of higher rates for a longer period of time. And that tends to weigh in the stock market. That's why the red line went down. The inverse occurred as well more recently, March, April of this year. Economic numbers started to weaken and the 10-year bond yield went down in anticipation that the Federal Reserve may cut rates sooner than expected. Stocks like that. Stocks like the idea that rates may you know, go down sooner than expected. So the inverse or opposite correlation, it's very evident. It's a long-term you know, correlation that's exi that exists now for quite a while. And even most recently, May of this year, Stocks have been quite strong. We've seen weaker numbers. We saw that non-farm payroll, you know, last uh, month come out very weak, what, 175. Uh, so certainly the stock market likes a prospect that would, looks like we're going into a lower interest rate environment. But now something has changed. We've seen a drop. While the stock market has remained quite steady, we have seen a drop in the 10-year yield last week from 461 to 433. That's 30, well, almost 30 basis points. 100 basis points is one percentage point. One-third of a complete percentage point we've seen drop in the 10-year bond. That's a pretty significant amount to drop, especially taking into consideration the S&P 500, the stock market, has been 
kind of flat. Now I know we're in earnings and, you know, GameStop goes up and Cisco goes down and the video goes up. But again, that always actually happens. There's always stocks that go up and down. But we've seen a true break in the correlation over the past week or so, uh, which is quite interesting because now, at least according to the stock market, well, I don't know, maybe stocks are anticipating that the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates, but it looks like from an economics point of view, the 10-year yield selling off the way it has, maybe that's forecasting economies in a little bit more trouble than we would have thought. Now, another way to look for confirmation, these are the Fed Fund's futures. Each line represents the probability at the Federal Reserve will cut rates. The blue line at the bottom is June. There's no chance they're going to cut rates. The meeting's just very, very soon. Red line, July, almost no chance. But we've seen a real acceleration in the September, November, and December. Now, September and November are very different situations. They're different months, of course, but they're also very different situations in what's going on in the math that I want to show you right now. Uh, this, These bars represent uh, the probability either in the blue bar that there's no change, quarter point cut in green, half point cut in red. Now, we see here, for example, in the September meeting, there's a 55% chance that the Fed will cut rates by a quarter, 35% chance they will not cut rates at all. But this is really interesting. Let's just take a step back and analyze what this is telling us. In September, look at the green bars. In September, there's a 55% chance the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates by a quarter. There's a 48% chance they're going to cut rates by a quarter in November. Wait a second. How does that make sense? There's less of a chance of a quarter point cut in November than there is in September. There's more of a chance. The answer is, is that look at the red bars now. There's a 26% chance the Federal Reserve will cut rates by half a point in November. This is really interesting. This is something that has just changed in the past couple of days or so with the Fed Fund's futures. Two things it's telling us. Number one, we knew already. September is a pivot point. September is the first time that we have a greater chance the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates than not cut rates. They're not cutting in June. They're not cutting in July. It's September. 55% chance that it's going to be a quarter point cut. But in November, the odds significantly improve that we're going to get more that will be more than a quarter point down, will be half a point down. I know it's only 26% that will have a half a point cut in November, but it's a pretty significant change. And then take a look at December. That bar rises even further. The message behind this, the Fed Funds futures, which are extremely impartial, are telling us that same way the bond market, those midterm maturities, that the expectation is the economy is weaken, weakening, but there's actually a pretty big difference between September and November, and that if we look at the data, if the trend continues with high inflation rates and declining jobs numbers, that we may have to get even more aggressive in cutting rates between September and November. By the way, speaking of jobs, we have jobs numbers this week. Uh, Jolt's report, we're going to have to talk about ADP and, of course, the big number at the end of the week. That We're going to have to revisit these numbers uh, and see if that shifts at all. But it's a really interesting dynamic, and everything is really kind of telling us the same story. Again, the bond market is now uh, breaking away from the stock market. The 10-year yield is you know, really you know, falling all, all over itself, uh, collapsing. And at the same time, the Fed funds futures for the first time are now indicating a much more of an aggressive stance in November. It seems that according to the bond and futures market, we may be in a little bit more trouble than we had maybe anticipated even as recently as last week. We hope this has been helpful. We look forward to seeing you back soon.